Hi there, welcome to another video from the Vickers MG Collection and Research Association. This is another episode in our gun study series where we take one of the guns that we have in the collection here, take a really close look at the markings, the detail, the machining, the manufacturing, and some of the, so in this case, some of the accessories on it as well, because we've got gun L1053, which is a June 1915 Aerith made Vickers machine gun. So that's the, the thousands and 53rd Vickers that was, that was produced of the, um, that first series, the L series, which we've got a whole video about comparing some of the different owl series guns we have in the collection um, but we're going to take a closer look at this one in particularly and we'll, we'll have a look at the tripod and the auxiliary tripod for it as well because um, they happen to be on this gun on display uh, in the collection here uh, so we might as well take that opportunity to do so but we've got more information you can see the firing video on the auxiliary mount as well before I take the camera off the stand though, just remind you please to subscribe, uh, make sure you like and share the video, and um, please do come and like us and, and find us on Facebook and Twitter as well. And of course, please do support us on Patreon if you can, um, where a small monthly amount uh, really does help keep the association's uh, costs going, um, keeping us uh, working at the moment while we can't have visitors to the collection because of the current restrictions. So yeah, patreon.com forward slash VickersMG would be really appreciated if you do sign up and help. So let's take the camera off the stand and take a closer look at this gun itself. So as always, let's try and start front to back. Um, and in this case, we've got the early Mark I muzzle attachment. So with the flat cone uh, on the end of that there, which means that it's not armored. The later Mark II, Mark II muzzle attachment cone has this, uh, it sticks out and is, it, and is armored. I think we've explained that in one of our Q&A vids. Um, this gun has the earlier type uh, metal steam tube as well. So this screws on, it doesn't clip on, it screws on all the way up that thread, which this isn't different to the guns that anybody has. It just sometimes you have a, an adapter that's over the top of this thread. The exceptions to that are the commercial guns uh, where they have like a, a browning um, machine gun type adapter. So um, what we've got no particular markings. This has been repainted in the color that it was found on, found on it. So we got that color matched, um, or the previous owner got that color matched and it's been marked and it's been sort of fully repainted in that color. What you will notice about, and I mentioned, is this is fitted with the auxiliary tripod. So the auxiliary tripod with its front band here that enables you to um, you know, secure the legs up and this leather strap actually acts as a carrying strap as well. So you can, you can flip it round over, up to the top and you can use it to carry the gun. Obviously the auxiliary mount um, is commonly called the Sankster mount. Um, you know, flips down means you don't have to use the large mounting with it. Now this mounting wasn't originally matched to the gun um, or you know, the tripods and, and, and guns weren't matched as such. This one came separately from it uh, and it is fitted with the later Mark II um, direction dial. What's also fitted with is it's fitted with these um, Allen key uh, screws as well. Now the, the, these wouldn't have been original. We don't know what these would date from but we haven't replaced them because um, you know, they, they came with it and, it and they came fitted with it, uh, but normally you'd have a, a, a nut, um, you know, tip, a typical sort of bolt uh, that goes in here. So it's certainly something a little bit different. Uh, what, what can I tell you about the, the, the tripod while we're sort of moving um, backwards? Nothing really too much. It is the later Mark, what, Mark 4B tripod, so it has the uh, grooves cut into the elevating wheel. Um, you know, the Mark, the, the earlier Marks uh, are, have a smooth elevating wheel and they'd have to be fitted with a uh, elevating wheel cover to try and work out what elevation uh, you were you, you were looking to. So that's, you know, the tripod's quite dusty. It's been up on display. Um, what we'll do is take another look at the gun. So let's go back to the front of the gun. We've looked at the tripod. Some of you may have noticed these, um, and I think we picked it out in the L series video we did, these patches, these are repairs to the water jacket because clearly there's some other damage here that didn't need repairing, didn't pierce. Uh, this does look like shrapnel damage. Uh, this would have been an armorer um, repair done in the field. So it was solder. Uh, it's covered in the equipment regulations for the army, how to repair these things. So uh, you know, solder and uh, small tins of sheet metal uh, can be used to, to, do, to do this kind of, this semi-permanent repair. Well, it is a permanent repair, you know, it's lasted ever since. Um, and it could have been done a, a many, many years ago. Certainly shows that this gun has seen some action. It also shows that the gun's quite worn through uh, as this has a small um, plate on it with EY, more commonly seen on rifles in the Second World War. EY has been the grenade launching rifles, meaning they're for emergency use for ball ammunition. So it probably means the barrel is shot out completely on the original one of these guns, but it, 
But the fact that this gun then is stamped with a drill purpose DP uh, alongside the serial number there, so L1053-1053. Uh, it's got DP marks there, it's got DP marks on the feed block cover here, and there are DP marks throughout this gun on the barrel casing and on many of the small parts that are, that are probably original to it or certainly contemporary from when it was uh, designate a drill purpose. So drill purpose means that it's only suitable for training purposes and shouldn't have ammunition, uh, live ammunition or ball ammunition or blank ammunition even put through it. However, this EY stamp would indicate that there's something still good about the gun and means that it can be used in emergencies. Uh, I'm not really sure what uh, what that would mean, it's not something you do normally see on drill purpose weapons. Like I say, it's it's more commonly seen on rifles, but clearly we have a um, Vickers machine gun here where they considered it uh, still suitable. Clearly doesn't just mean it's for grenade launchers because this is not a grenade launcher. Uh, as we move back along the gun you can see it's got a steel feed block in here. We'll take a closer look at that when we turn around the other side. You can see all this machining. This is what gives us a really good indication of an early Vickers machine gun. High quality metalwork, finished well with smooth machining and deep machining. So this lightens the gun considerably. Uh, a previous blog article shows that where we weighed some of these guns. These are three kilograms, uh, seven pounds lighter than a 1918 made gun. So June 1915 to I think it was a March 1918 gun that we compared. These are three kilograms or seven pounds lighter, which is quite a difference. And it's purely because of this, 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 this machine. And this five arch top cover, again, is one of those telltale signs of an early, very early Vickers machine gun. Clearly top covers come off and end up on different guns. So you will have to check the serial number and check what else is on the gun. Um, but yeah, so we've got no dial sight fitted on this and we've got quite an early tangent sight that we'll look at a little bit closer when we turn it round. Uh, but just worth noting that, you know, Something's wrong with the spring that's taken a hit at some point. It takes a little bit of effort to get that to stay down. You have to really push it into place. Um, while we are around this side, you can see the um, stop here, the elevating stop so that when the gun goes down, this um, the base of the gun doesn't get damaged on the rear of the crosshead here. Uh, so this elevate and stop, again, this is one of those lightened pieces um, that you see on early Vickers machine guns. And Another lightning point here is the bottom of the um, trigger bar. So we've got the trigger bar coming down here in, in the cross piece. This is actually bored out. Uh, again, just to say, save those minor grains of weight, tiny amounts um, being, being saved everywhere possible that all adds up to that seven pound difference. So we'll stop taking a look there and we'll turn the gun around so we can have a look at the other side. So here we are on the right hand side of the gun and we'll, we'll start at the back again. Um, so you can see on, on this side of the breech casing, you've got this lightning as well. It's brilliant. It, it really shows the detail and the smoothness of the metal is so different to what you see on later guns. Uh, one of the markings we've got here on the crank handle, VSM, Vickers Sons and Maxim. We've got that on the roller, um, on the slide, sorry, just in the middle there. And either side of that, can you see the D and the P showing that this is also you know, designated drill purpose. Don't use this roller in a real gun. Um, you know, or the, <laughs> the, the collar roller, not just the roller. Um, don't use it in a ball firing gun. Uh, so we've got that. We've got some wear here as well, which is quite interesting to see um, on, on the crank handle. Not really sure. It's possibly um, tooling marks from where this may have broken. Um, you know, it, it certainly is a very, very different finish in the metal and it does feel like it's been um, ground away somehow. Uh, on the uh, check lever here, you can see that this would have originally had, um, and you can just see the pin of it there, this would have had the early type check lever with a piston and a spring against this stop. So this later type check lever, uh, this is the, the you know, number two check lever, uh, was introduced because that you know, this the light and check lever the, the sprung check lever was superfluous. Now we've talked about that in the spare parts video, um, and we have an example on our Nepalese Vickers. But this has obviously been you know um, changed when the check lever was changed. Uh, this back plate for it was uh, ground down as well, um, and it's and it's been painted. Now normally the only painting would be on the um, uh, bar on on the barrel casing here um, and then on the feed block if this was a brass feed block it should be painted on top um, this shouldn't necessarily be painted but but it came to us painted so we've always maintained that um, originality so uh, we believe this gun came from I think it was Pakistan as part of a batch in around 2000 or the late 1990s um, and it was 
reassembled from a number of guns in that batch and uh, I'll show you why when we get looking at the inside and the underneath of the gun because there's a number of matching, um, matching components on it. But you can see on the feed block here that this is an early type feed block that hasn't been ground out. So this thumb space here for the uh, top levers uh, is on later guns ground out uh, so that you can actually fit a bigger thumb um, or a gloved thumb in there. And this feed block has a couple of other markings on it. Uh, so drill purpose again, but then another serial number 8504. And that would have indicated the, the gun to which the serial number was matched. They rarely put AL or C or the other, they rarely put the letter prefix with these. Um, but this is clearly a, um, an early feed block. Whether this is a later gun or not, we don't know. But it, again, it was drill purpose. And this is what came with the gun um, at the time that we acquired it. So there's no damage on this side of the, ba of the uh, barrel casing, which is quite nice to see. So it shows that it, it was more than likely shrapnel on that, le that left-hand side of the gun. And we're back to the front. And at the front, you know, we, we, we've talked about enough there. Uh, what I would just say, though, is you, know, you can see corks incredibly um, damageable and easily lost. So you know, this should have a cork on. Um, and we're currently looking at how we can produce some rubber corks or something like that for, you know, it's an oxymoron, isn't it? Rubber cork. But um, we're currently trying to see how we can do that uh, so that they're a bit more, a bit less fragile on display. You can see here as well that the, how the auxiliary tripod fits. So it's a big clamp, uh, goes around here um, on there and a, and a clamping screw and um, butterfly nut on the front there. Uh, is there any markings of note? Not obviously so on the top of this one we'll have to wait another day to be able to see the markings on one of the others in the collection so let's take the gun off of the uh, main tripod uh, in a moment we'll look at the tripod first and, and we can have a look inside the gun uh, but let's have a look at the tripod because on the tripod here i don't know if you can see that under the light you can see the markings along the top so later tripods and the australian made tripods all have cast markings into the side here the early maxim style tripods um, are stamped in the top here and you can't just can't see it very easily but it's got its reg number reg so that's its registered number um, and then a, a serial number that goes alongside it and then up towards the front um, i believe is a date and um, the place of manufacture which when we get the gun off we'll get a torch and we'll just have a have a closer look at that it's not coming up on the light of the camera there uh, so yeah let's take the gun off the tripod and uh, have a closer look at inside the gun and the tripod itself so let's just take a look at this tripod top quickly so we've got reg number 2037 so that's its serial number and then up towards the front here you can just start to see 303 maxim mark 4 and then RCD, which is Royal Carriage Department, and the date of manufacture, which is 1911. So just a, that's just a nice reminder that these obviously predate the Vickers machine gun. And were, the Mark IV mounting tripod was originally designed for the Maxim uh, machine gun in British service. And actually, when Vickers presented the, um, the Vickers machine gun for trials, uh, the British Army sent it back. So the School of Musketry Trials are all readable uh, on our um, Patreon pages. So uh, through the Small Arms Committee minutes, we've got all that available for people. Um, and you can you can read how they said, no, we don't want the commercial tripod. We want it to work with a Mark IV mounting because it was the best tripod of the time in their opinion. Um, it's certainly the most sturdy, you know, it weighs 50 pounds um, and it does exactly what it needed to, whereas the commercial tripod had a lot of bells and whistles on it. So let's say this is a 1911 made tripod. Um, I think this is the earliest in our collection, if I remember rightly. Uh, so yeah, we've got that off. It's worth just pointing out as well that inside um, you've got these uh, stops to, to make it easy to find the right position for the Vickers once uh, um, once that's inside, once you drop the gun in. Um, you know, th these quite often are dated and marked differently. Uh, I don't think these ones are. I think these are fitted with the tripod, but they do come out and on earlier guns, um, you, on earlier tripods and on those that these don't fit to, you need to um, make sure that the gun is doesn't drop and, and sit on this bar, otherwise you won't be able to fit it. Um, sometimes this bar is bigger so that it just drops straight on it as well, I believe. Um, so yes, that's the tripod looked at. So we'll take a look inside the gun. 
So on top of the gun, on the rear cross piece, you can see that we've got these DP stamps again on everything. So both sides of the cross piece, on top of the uh, oil brushes that are in the handles there as well. Uh, this is a Mark II tangent sight, so it's slightly different to the Mark II Star Star, or the Mark II Star, which is a flatter um, um, knob, uh, you know, for better, better word. Um, it's a flatter uh, knob on the slide, so that it's you can also so so that it's easier to use actually with gloves. This can get quite slippery. You then also have this um, you know notch, uh, which is a much simpler notch than the. Uh, sort of bead sight that appears on the later Mark II Star Star uh, tangent sights. So this one, if we just undo the tangent sight and slide it up there, if we can, if it'll let me. It is the spring is um, turning up. So underneath that, we've got Vickers Sons and Maxim uh, 303, no, 3037 number two Mark One. So that's the 303 Mark Seven cartridge. And this is the tangent site um, slide number two, Mark one. So it means that it's um, yeah, not for Mark six ammunition, which obviously the um, Maxims do fit with. And again, this is another piece of equipment that was insisted upon by the School of Musketry in their trials that would be the same as the British Service Maxim. So the site that you see on the commercial and the trials vickers, um, and you can see in one of our photo analysis videos, actually fits on top of the feed block. Uh, this is the British Service site that was insisted upon. You can see it's been used a fair amount as well because we've got that um, mark there from where it gets flipped up um, where in the metal which shows that this you know clearly has seen a, a fair amount of service now what i wanted to show you um on the inside of these uh, uh one of the reasons it has been matched is um oh it's not on this one i'll have to show you somewhere else but we'll show you on the you can see the different all the little markings we've got is that an s vsm s over vsm um, which I can't tell you what actually S is over VSM. Normally we see an LG there for light gun. So it's interesting that that's an S. I'd have to look that one up, um, which is always good fun. We've got the inspector's mark here, which is the V over 529, quite a common inspector's mark, having looked at several hundred uh, trigger bars recently um, and other components. We've then got VSM itself. We've got DP marked on there. Um, we've got another broad arrow. We've got the Enfield inspector's mark as well, where it will have come through the Royal Small Arms Factory for acceptance. Um, we've got an S, which I'm not really sure what that one is. Um, and yeah, that's it all up there. The top cover stops as well are, um, are lightened. You see this on quite a lot of later guns. Um, it seems to be the last bit of lightning that survives, which is, which is quite nice. Um, but you can see how these are all machined out. We've got every little bit of extra, extra weight taken out of here. Sometimes these are much, much heavier and much sturdier. Um, if we look inside the gun a bit more there's no sort of real noticeable uh, differences we've got a, a c in a circle which is a crayford stamp and we've got a v in a circle which just means it's vickers um means their acceptance stamps we've got a v over 11 which is another of the vickers uh, uh you know, sort of inspectors marks and we've got the v over um a number there which is the number of the inspector so you know it's it, it's quite a clean gun inside it's been well looked after uh, and we will just take a little bit of a further look at the internal components. Um, we'll drop this rear cross piece and see what we can learn from that. Before I do that, I've just taken the lock out quickly because it's quite interesting. We've got 1053, as I said, the serial number of the gun on the lock and the drill purpose mark, but the lock itself is actually made in Australia in 1942. So, yeah, and this is a deactivated lock. And we've also got 1053 and DP on the side there. So, uh, yeah, we, we know components come along later, but this has been matched to the gun and, and marked up so it wouldn't be put in any other gun, um, which does make sense in the drill purpose gun. There's no need to uh, have them anywhere else. Uh, there's no need to put these locks, they don't need to be interchangeable so we can have a high amount of wear on this one gun and not be confused with other locks that may end up in other, um, other guns. Now what I wanted to show you underneath the gun is this is also skeleton, um, skeletonized, serialized to the gun, L1053. And now this is in exactly the same script um, and style of etching or style of stamping or, or whatever 
um, as the serial number on the barrel casing. So this is contemporary. This is from the gun when it was made. So the fact that this survives, and you can see as well that this is all machined out in the rear. Um, you know, it's, it's got that same telltale machining uh, that shows a really early lightened gun. So L1053 being marked on the bottom there is a great find. Um, you've got the, uh, some additional markings, just a drill purpose marking on the bottom cover as well with a C over 20. Um, and you've got all of this you know, additional metal and everything machined away from the bottom of the, of the, um, of the uh, barrel trunnions there. So um, yeah, so it's nice to have, be able to see that that survived uh, the entire life of the gun. And when I say these were put together, um, some of these components were on different guns, but from the same batch that was imported at the same time. So they were rematched, um, possibly after some years apart. Now I've just taken the uh, feed block out to have a closer look, and let's say it's got a number there, 8304, DP, DP, DP stamped, but it also K878, which is possibly the original number of the gun. There was a K series of machine guns produced later on, like 1917, 1918, um, and it's possible, um, it will be from that series of guns. So this, let's say, one of the earliest steel uh, feed blocks um, with that smaller um, you know, aperture there. And if we look in, it's got a Mark II barrel. It would originally had a Mark I barrel without the, uh, without the thread for the muzzle cup, but it has been um, you know, replaced with a Mark II. And you can see again, all this machining out of the side of the, um, of the rear of the breech casing just to save those few extra ounces uh, all the time. So really interesting to be able to t you know, to see these early production methods. Now that was all dropped, you know, it wasn't to make the gun heavier deliberately, um, it was so that you could increase manufacture because obviously machining takes time. Machining is a quite a manual task on a machine gun. Uh, you know, it would require somebody stood there at a milling machine to you know, take out this additional material. So. If you don't need to do that, you don't need a person to do that, you don't need a skilled machinist to be able to do that. Uh, so you can produce them a lot quicker. And you know, the difference of around 12 a week at the start of the war to 200 a week at the end of the war across the factories um, means that you, you don't need to do that. And obviously this is an Erith produced gun. The Crayford produced guns uh, are largely unlightened. There is some exceptions to that, uh, but they're largely unlightened. It means you didn't even have to put the um, tooling and everything in there in the first place. So you know, it, it, it's a great sort of example of showing the industrialization of warfare uh, and, and the, you know, the mobilization of industry to be able to produce weapons quicker and not just um, what, you were, what you would hope. So there you go, there's our 1053. I hope that's been interesting and we'll be along with another gun study uh, in a month's time. Thanks for watching. Thank you for watching. Please remember to like and share the video and subscribe to the channel. Please support us on Patreon if you're able to and let us know of anything you'd like to see in the future. I look forward to hearing from you.